Lord, we welcome you to our question and answer sessions uh, bordering on the quarterly review. Some of the lessons we have had in this quarter and uh, other questions are from the general questions people have asked us. Please note that some of these questions are from the YAYA lessons and the general, the adult lesson. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace that we have received again to be alive and to remain as your children. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that as we answer all these questions, you will please shine your light. You will give us understanding. And please let your name be glorified. Thank you, Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. One of the questions we have, maybe I say the first question, is somebody sent a question to us, and this question we have to listen. It says, why are women the main tool used to bring down men? First, I should ask you that question. Do you think that is correct? Do you think that is what obtains? Why are women the main tools used to bring down men? Are women made for the downfall of man? No. A man can fall just the same way a woman can fall. A man can be a tool to the downfall of a woman. The same way a woman could be a tool to the downfall of a man. There are many factors actually that can bring down a man. So when we begin to discuss all this, then you will see that it is not as a result of uh, the creation of women or the existence of women that man has to fall. There are many factors. For instance, pride can bring down a man. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, you find it there. Pride can bring down a man. It is a major pitfall. Also, covetousness can bring down a man. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Laziness can also bring down a man. These three points, among others, are major pitfalls that are capable of bringing anybody down. So the main point to say here is everyone should work on their weak points. Everybody has a weak point. Everybody has a breaking point. So when you identify your weak point, work on it. If money is your weak point, you have to work on yourself and protect yourself. If women are your weak points, some people don't just like women. They like certain species. They say, I like Indian ladies. Some people will say, I like Aousa ladies. I, it is not bad to like people, but you have to identify your weak point and then work on it, protect yourself so that you do not fall. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 where the Bible says you should be wise like a serpent. Keep your weak points. Work on them. So, to answer your question, the Bible did not say women, uh, women are responsible for the downfall of man. The Bible did not say women will bring man down. It, it is not like that. We have cases in the Bible where a woman was instrumental. We have cases where a man was instrumental to the downfall of a woman. Praise God. And then uh, another person is asking why spiritual gifts are not pointer to spiritual maturity. Why are spiritual gifts not pointer to spiritual maturity? I remember that one is in one of our lessons. Spiritual gifts are given by God to believers irrespective of whether or not you just give your life to Christ. So if you ask God for spiritual gifts, he will give you. Some people gave their lives to Christ, and by the time they ask conversion, the gift of God gets into them. Some people pray to receive theirs. God is the giver of the, sp of, of, of the gift. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to every man as he wishes. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 4 to 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 
4 to 11, the Bible says, God, the Holy Spirit gives every man liberally as he wishes. And the reason for the gift of the Spirit is for the edification of the church, that is the body of Christ. And every member, I mean, every man has this gift. If you have the gift, it is for you to profit with. While spiritual maturity is a function of your exposure, experience, and knowledge. Your exposure, your experience, the, all the things you have gone through will help you to understand what to do with your life. If you have received the gift of prophecy and God has taken you through certain lessons in life, you will know how to use that gift well, such that it will not be at your own detriment. Spiritual gifts are divine enablement to carry out specific spiritual assignments. The fruits of the Spirit are stated in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5 from verse 22 to 23 is the key to maturity. The fruits of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is different from the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit means enablement that you have received as from, the Spirit, from the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are those virtues that you have grown. The Holy Spirit has planted them into you. The fruit is produced as a result of the seed of Christ planted in every believer which grows through the watering of the word of God and humility in following the leading of the Spirit. The more you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, the more you learn from Him. The more you learn from Him, the more you become knowledgeable, the more you become experienced. Some things the Holy Spirit will take you through them. Some things will happen to you so that you will learn. Some things the Holy Spirit will sit you down and teach you. And that is what gives maturity. Romans chapter 8 from verse 15 to 16. Romans 8, 15 to 16. We mature daily by walking with the Holy Spirit, by walking in the Spirit and saying no to the dictates of the flesh. You can be gifted and then you still be misbehaving. You can be speaking in tongues. You can be, well, what other gifts do we have? You, some people, people can have gifts and still be misbehaving and still be living without, uh, uh, still be living a, a reckless life. So, and people can be misbehaving and go to hell. You cannot miss heaven with the manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, remind yourself of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 from verse 22. Praise the Lord. Another question is, can a Christian actively participate in Nigeria's politics? Like we said in the lesson, Christian and governance, Christian and politics, and so on, we have said that we must be involved. If you continue to look for excuses for your complacency, if you continue to look for excuses for not participating in politics, you will just discover that ungodly people will make laws for godly people to follow, to obey. And that will be at their detriment. Christians must actively participate in politics because the only way to get rid of darkness is to let the light shine. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. We cannot, we, we cannot also have dominion over the forces of darkness if we refuse to be involved in politics. Politics is the means by which people are governed everywhere. If you are born again, just like Joseph and Daniel in their generation, you can choose not to defile yourself and stand tall even in the present day Nigeria. Now, people may want to ask, you may want to ask, oh, pastor, for you to become the president of Nigeria in a certain party, you have to buy form for 100 million naira. How can I do that as a Christian? If I buy a form for 100 million naira, will I not get there to begin to look for how to recover my fund? 
Now, let the Spirit of God guide you. Connect with like minds, Christians who will rally around you. At this junction, I want to encourage every Christian to learn, not to criticize their own. When you have a believer, a Christian in government, a Christian in politics, rally around the person. Let us see how we can encourage the person. If the person is doing wrong, let us see how we can correct him. Not to say, and you call yourself a Christian. We will not say that. Let us learn wisdom from the Holy Spirit of God and encourage our own. And then don't say, I, I'm joining politics as a fresh person. I want to go and begin from the top. Everybody should learn to climb the ladder from the lowest rung. Please, you should be involved. Pray and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Another question. Using the case of Samson, does the Bible condone suicide? Uh, people say Samson prayed. He said, God, empower me again this time uh, so that I can avenge myself from my enemies and I should die with them. I think the, 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 the lesson for us to learn there is we should not allow any distress, any trouble to make us pray wrong prayers. Some people will say, God, I have been married for 20 years. I don't have a child of my own. At least let me be pregnant in the morning and the pregnant should be aborted in the evening. Some people will say, God, I have not given birth. I have prayed. I have fasted. Okay, please let me give birth to a child. Let the child just stay with me for one day and the child dies. If you have prayed such wrong prayers, the mercy of God will erase them, cancel them for you in Jesus' name. Please don't pray wrong prayers. That he prayed to die with his enemy was a wrong point for him. Now, the fact that Judas committed suicide and it is written, stated in the Bible, and Samson prayed that kind of prayer and he died with his enemies. The fact that that happened does not make it normal. It is a grievous sin to kill yourself. The Bible never condoned uh, suicide. It is an abomination and a straight way to hell. That is what we believe. That Samson or Judas committed suicide and the uh, mentioned they were mentioned in the Bible does not make it normal. It is a terrible sin. Does an irresponsible man deserve submission? This one must be coming from a woman. Or let's say maybe a man is just trying to reason things out to say, if I become irresponsible, we should my wife still uh, uh, submit to me? First, I should mention that nobody should make themselves irresponsible. If you are irresponsible, pray to God and then talk to yourself. Change your ways. First Peter chapter 3 from verse 1 to 2. First Peter 3, 1 and 2. The Bible says, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. That is, if anybody is an unbeliever, if a husband is an unbeliever, if a wife is an unbeliever, and he sees the, the good character of the believer husband, or the believing husband, that person should be able to correct himself and change. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear. Hence, wives are to submit in their attitude to their husbands in order to win the hearts of their husbands to Christ. Don't say my husband is behaving irresponsibly. Therefore, I have to disrespect him. I have to, to, to act badly to him. Don't do that. Continue to do well. Continue to show him love. Continue to pray for him. Continue to respect him. I believe God that with prayer and your commitment, that fellow will change in Jesus' name. Can you say amen with me? And a, a similar question. Should a wife carry all the responsibility alone when the husband is there? 
Maybe this one is also from a woman. Ask him if my husband, my husband is alive, my husband is there. Uh, should I be the only one carrying responsibilities? Now, don't exaggerate. If you are only doing one thing, maybe one month you paid the children's school fee, maybe because the husband doesn't have money at that time, that doesn't mean you have done everything. If uh, the husband is there and he refuses to pay the rent, he is working, he has money. He refuses, to pay, he refuses to pay the rent, to pay the children's school fee, he refuses to do this one, to bring money for food and so on. That one, please pray for him, report to the pastor, let the pastor look for a wise way to counsel him. That is if both of you are believers. No partner can carry all the responsibility of the marriage alone. No partner can carry all alone. Even if one partner is bringing in all the money, the other may be the one putting the house in order. So men, don't say I'm the only one working. I'm the only one bringing in money. My wife is just a, a, a sit-at-home wife. Don't forget that taking care of children is serious business. Doing house chores, taking care, making sure the children um, attend to their assignments and so on, taking them to school is serious business. So, so don't say that your wife is lazy, staying at home, but everybody should work. Work, make sure you are bringing in something. And um, note that 1 Timothy chapter 5, chapter 5 verse 18 says, if any, ma if any provide not for his own home, uh, that person is worse than an infidel. The Bible did not say it must be the man alone that must be doing it. So, as a wife, you are supposed to help your husband, support your husband. Now, supporting your husband should not mean that you will now say you are the one doing everything. Support the husband. Husband, don't say my wife is working after all. So my wife, and then you now say, wife, uh, we want to pay house rent. Bring in, you are, the house rent is 600,000 naira. You are to pay 300,000. I am to pay 300,000. And now begin to share, divide financial responsibilities at home. That is not correct. You should be willing to pay the money. And your wife will now see that ah, my husband is trying to pay. Let me support. Not that you will now hand over your responsibility to the wife. May God provide for every husband watching this such that you will be strong enough financially to foot all your bills. And may God help every woman watching this with, a, with financial blessing such that you would gladly help your husband. Don't forget your help meet for him. Don't let him die young so that all the responsibilities you don't want to carry now, will now you will now be the one carrying them. Please encourage your husband, help them, support them. God will support all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. What can a couple uh, what can make a couple, rather, what can make a couple not to care for themselves when they are healed? Maybe when the husband is sick, the wife refuses to take care of the husband. When, uh, and the husband now says, eh, well, because my wife did not attend to me when I was sick. When, he, when she breaks down too, when she falls sick too, I will not attend to her. I will not help her. If you read First John chapter 4, verse 8, 1 John 4 verse 8 and then the whole of 1 Corinthians 13. You will discover that it means that both of them lack genuine love. They lack the agape love, the unconditional and sacrificial love. Hence, they are supposed to sit together, beg each other, say, my wife, I am sorry for all that I have done to offend you. And the wife also apologizes and both of them mix up their mind to begin to take care of each other. That's the best way to go. Discuss it. Talk, about, talk over it. And then forgive one, each other. Pray together. And look for a way to forge ahead. It means you lack unconditional love. You must now make effort to love each 
order. When there is a collapse of trust in the home, what can we do? This is another question. When there is a collapse of trust or a betrayer, whether financial betrayer, emotional betrayer, what can we do? The first thing we should do is forgive your spouse and trust God to rebuild the trust that both of you have lost. You need to rededicate your life, your, your lives and your marriage to Christ. Both husband and wife should rededicate their lives and rededicate their marriage to Christ. Pray together for love and God will help you. Forgive first whatever your spouse has done that makes you to feel betrayed. Whatever your husband has done that makes you not want to trust him again or not want to trust her again, you should look for how to discuss it prayerfully, lovingly, with an open mind, with the mind to forgive and then forgive your spouse. Pray to God to help you. If you need a counselor, seek a matured Christian to counsel you. Your pastor can just fit in. Praise the Lord. Another question is this. I keep remembering what my spouse did that hurt me. What can I do? My husband did something. And that's any time I remember, it makes me feel bad. My wife did something that hurts me badly. What can I do? What should you do? It is normal for you to remember, even after you have said you have forgiven the person. You will still remember because your brain has not been formatted now. Your brain is still there. Your senses are working well. So you will still remember. However, the fact that you have forgiven the person will help you not to want to avenge, not to want to pay back. Not to say, ah, I remember that my husband took my ATM card, withdrew all the money and spent it. You remember? And that is very painful. My husband took money from me that he wanted to visit my parents, that he was going to visit my parents. I sent him, I gave him some money to help me deliver to my parents, and my husband spent all the money. He didn't even give them a dime. That is possible. But forgive. If you have forgiven the person, you will still remember, but you will, you will not have the urge to want to retaliate. Even though the remembrance is painful, the ability not to contemplate or think about revenging is a sign that God is healing your wound gradually. Let me remember to mention that time heals. So you just forgive. Make effort to, for, to, to, to live fine with the person, with your spouse, and you will just discover that with time, you will continue, the pain will go down. With time, God will heal the wound. So keep trusting God for the grace to overcome completely and to forgive. God will help you. Amen. Please smile and say, Amen. Uh, well, this question, uh, I want you, if you are a single, especially if you are not married, to listen to this, and you believe time is going. This fellow is asking, I am 35 years old. I'm 35, no suitor. That is, no man is coming to ask for my hand in marriage. Should I still be patient? We say patience is a virtue. And you have encouraged us. The Sunday school has encouraged everyone to wait. We even said, if you are finding, if you are having delay in marriage, you are not, is, you are being delayed in getting married. That that is one aspect of your life that is not really working well. Commit that one prayerfully to the hand of God. And the aspect of your life that is working well, maybe for instance, you are you are not married yet, but as a lady, you have your job a well-paying job. You have something good going on for you in another part, aspect of your life. Focus on them. The money you get, use them to invest. Do good for yourself. Build a house if you can. Buy a good car. Live good life. Eat well. Wear good clothes. Go out. Uh, 
do, do things that make you happy while you pray and trust God to meet your marital need. Now, at the point when you become desperate about getting married and you start jumping from one mountain to the other, you start fasting marathon from one marathon to the other. Uh, somebody says you will fast, white fast, you take that one. Yellow fast, you take that one. Uh, saltless, fa saltless fat, fast, you take that one. Daniel's fast. Now, I'm not saying, I'm just saying all oh, this type of fast because that's what people get themselves, uh, they involve themselves in. By the time you begin to show that you are desperate to get married, the devil will make you think or feel that God has forgotten you. But God has not forgotten you. You may just be a step away from the godly man that will propose to you. So don't give up because God has not given up on you. With God, you can never be too patient. So be patient and trust God to answer your prayers. Your marriage is for an appointed time and it will surely come to pass in Jesus' name. You may not be doing anything wrong, but never don't relent on the good works you are doing. In due time, the favor of God will speak for you and God will make your life beautiful in his own time. I pray for you that God will break every gate of brass in the name of Jesus. Every bass of iron, it will cut them asunder and you will have your breakthrough maritally and every area of your life where your patience has been tested in Jesus' name. Your waiting is for the best of God to manifest. God loves you dearly. I want you to prayerfully read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4. Psalm 102, verse 13. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Finally, you should relax. Relax your mind and read James chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4. I pray for you that as you continue to learn uh, through Sunday school, uh, God himself will encourage you. He will encourage you with answered prayers. He will encourage you with divine blessings. He will encourage you in the name of Jesus. I also want to encourage you that you should not stop serving God. Don't stop doing good for God. Don't stop being good to people. Be kind. And then don't put yourself in a compromised situation. Always stay where the blessings of God will locate you. And then you say, where, how do I know where the blessings of God will locate you? Listen to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you will hear a voice. And the voice will tell you, this is the way. Walk therein. As you continue with us, you journey with us in the word of God. God himself will make your life beautiful. Thank you for being part of the Sunday School in this quarter. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. And I commit all your children to you. Everyone who has one question or the other, that the Holy Spirit will attend to them in Jesus' name. That the peace of God will abide with every one of us and that your love will not depart from us. At the end of our lives, let us please make it to heaven. Thank you, Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Please like, share, and subscribe. It is very important for you to subscribe. Please tell all others on the school teachers that this YouTube channel exists and encourage everyone to subscribe. Thank you. Jesus is for us, we shall come.